This is an aerial film taken of the University of Lasonomy Students' Reunion in Wisconsin. The 50 state flags were placed along the west edge of the university property. The stars and stripes were carried by Merle Hayden. Then, on Saturday evening, the rain came down in torrents. But the law of maneuverability was with us, and the sun dawned bright and warm, drying out the flags and the ground. It was a beautiful morning. Sign. That was big advertising. It helped make the autonomy a, a common word almost. Of course, it won't get in the dictionary for a long time, but <laughs> when I was here, people would come in here. I've gone by that sign a million times. Did they finally give up and had to stop. <laughs> How many people would just stop by once they saw the sign? You been going by the farm? Yeah, did you get people Not to stop many. in? Curiosity, curiosity is gone. Lasonomy is a whole new philosophy of thought. It deals with the social system, the money system, natural law, health, all interwoven into the operation of the human race. I just happen to be young enough to get in right in the beginning and get an understanding of it. I'm the last surviving crusader from the 30s that's still promoting lasonomy principles. I never worked for money for myself. See. I gave my entire life to the organization. I don't know why, but I save everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. I knew Merle way, way back, 1939. We get along now just about the same as we did when I was 14, and he must have been 15. Uh, see, nothing else here. Millions of people grabbed onto this lawsonomy, and I don't know a lot about what it was all about in the first place, other than that a lot of people were involved in some political action back in the 30s when everybody lost their jobs and didn't have food enough to feed their families. So people were grabbing for something. He says that he took an oath to be part of it the rest of his life. Uh, I don't say it's wrong, but I don't understand it. When he was 18, he took off, went where he could do more in the organization. I asked him, where are you going and when are you coming back? <laughs> and he said, I don't know. One of the last times I drove 
hell for lost in some place and I don't remember where it was. He says, it's my one hope that great men will spring up in the future and take hold of this work. That they will be willing to devote their lives in an endeavor to put the whole human race upon a footing of equality. But I, I worked with Lawson in the right under him. See. That's how I really got to know him and to know his thinking. Lawson had international claim in five separate fields. In aircraft, he was the lead educator worldwide for seven years. And Lawson built the first airliner, and he put the word aircraft into the dictionary. He laid the foundation of the industry. He could have been a multimillionaire. He could have been a billionaire before they started talking about it. But when the Depression hit in 29, he renounced ownership of wealth for himself to spend the rest of his life coaching the people on how to save their country and build a better human race. Roughly speaking, 99% of the human race have very little or no accumulated wealth. The 1% control the great bulk of it. There is a mighty good reason for this state of affairs. The American people have been lulled into a deep sleep by the financiers. It is my duty to wake them up. He could see the injustice and the corruption of the system, and he started organizing it. He had over 15 million people coast to coast marching against the financial system. And yet, in all the history books, try and find his name even. He didn't even there, see. Disappeared. Will the sodomy principles ever take over the world? I don't know. But I go to Oshkosh and reach as many people as I can with what I've got. Oshkosh, Wisconsin. They come from around the world, and so people we could never meet otherwise would meet here. And it's the best place in the world for us to introduce Lawson's aircraft works to people. All of Lawson's activities, Lasonomy. It's really awesome the first time I think anybody comes up here. Oh, this is just huge. You can't believe how many trailers you see, how many motorhomes you see, and people. Now, where is that guy? Is it a big one? <laughs> I think it was 2002, the first time I came up here. Merle's been coming up for 30 years, something like that. He can probably tell you. Go on, that's enough. Here? No, no, that's enough. You sure? Yep. All right. That's it. I think a wife would get kind of tired of spending their vacation every year up here at the air show. <laughs> I'd rather go to a lake someplace and be peaceful and quiet. This is certainly not peaceful. <laughs> I think that this sort of a thing, this show, is too much. Uh, well, this is my main record, but I do a few of these every morning. Health-wise, he's, he's in good condition, but you know, everybody says, well, he's almost 90, you know. You can only live so long. He figures he's got about 20 more years of this. And um, he said, oh yeah, I got this guy and that one that's gonna help. And, and I know that he's okay, I interested in meeting young people and trying to get them interested in it. I, w I was young once, he couldn't get me interested in it, in the whole deal. Let's pull it back. 
Up until 1990, we had enough of the old timers that were carrying the load. Everybody that I've got helping me now was through the through the air show. You know, like Jim. Forward or backward, does it matter? So I said, as long as you can do it. I first met Merle sometime in the early 80s. And I came here to Oshkosh because I have an interest in pre-World War I aviation. So in the distance, I see a booth with three giant models of biplanes hanging over it. And I told myself, whatever that is, it's for me. And uh, that's how I met Merle. Just about. I learned about Lawson. And then I went home. And this was before the internet. And I couldn't find anything out about Lawsonomy. Did he finish this one? He finished it, yeah. Did he fly it? He crashed. It didn't take off. It didn't get altitude. So that airplane never flew. That one didn't. This one flew. So why are you here? Educating people. What you interested in? Aircraft? Yes. Health? Health, yeah. Economics? Yes. yes. We get it all. What well, is Lausanne? Well, there's three volumes over there I'll tell you about it. Is it a religion or what is it? Philosophy of life, physical, mental, moral. Oh, really? So is it a religion? Eh? Well, it's a, if you believe in God, I guess you yeah. got a religion. If you don't, yeah. you don't. Okay. <laughs> well, here's the story as best I can piece it together. Lawson was a professional Major League Baseball player, pioneer aviator, and then later he starts his own religion. That's an interesting story. My question is, why is not everyone else fascinated with that? Your analysis of the man and his importance. Lawson tried so much in so many different fields made apparent strides forward and then faltered. It makes a wonderful story, in my view. It was awfully hard to write a chapter on Lawson's childhood. I cannot find any other material except his play, Childhood Days of Alfred Lawson. In there, he makes it pretty plain that he had very pronounced intellectual interests. Keep in mind that he never got past the sixth grade, but Lawson was always looking for the opportunity for himself to cash in on new developments, and baseball was a boom industry in the 1890s. He played for the Boston Bean Eaters of the National League and also for the Pittsburgh Alleghenies, but then he went back to managing and running minor leagues and introduced baseball to South Africa and Australia he may have been the first person to put numbers on baseball uniforms. Lawson was always looking for a first. First this, first that. That was certainly true in baseball and in aviation. He was among the very first in aviation. In 1908, the Wright brothers flew for the first time publicly. And aviation fever hit the country. And so Lawson saw the opportunity to start Fly Magazine, the first popular aviation magazine in the world. And that started his aviation career. When he left Fly Magazine, he decided the time had come to found a commercial airline. Before anyone else would ever have thought that airplanes could someday be a major carrier of people, he wanted to be the guy that would bring that off. If you walked onto it today, you would say it looks exactly the way the current airliners look. That is a long corridor, seats on both sides, the pilot's area up front. That plane was produced in four or five months' time, and uh, which was flown on its maiden voyage from Milwaukee to, to New York and back. And Lawson was the hero of the moment in 1919. Wherever there was business enough, the gypsy flyer settled down. He bought a bigger plane, rented a larger cow pasture, and often gave free rides, especially to the ladies. They were going to 
going to make Milwaukee the, uh, the Detroit of the aviation industry. The trouble was, instead of setting out to make more planes like the one he had just made, he wanted to make a bigger one. He cannibalized his first plane in order to make the second plane, which doesn't really put you very far ahead. And secondly, that, it called for a lot of redesign. It threw him way behind schedule. Finally, his investor says, get that plane in the air. So he flew. The plane did take off, but it didn't get high enough. And the wing caught a tree, and that brought it down. And his investor said, that's it, no more. That was the, the end of the, the, the real prospect Lawson had to do something. When you look back on that, though, and, uh, that was a major turning point in Lawson's life. And it also gave him the chance to pursue what he always claimed he wanted to do, and that is carry his, his studies into the field of economics. So according to Lawson, they came to him and offered him money to become a power broker in the financial world, and he didn't want it. It was his rejection of them which caused them to reject him. See, he joined the Aero Club in 1908. It was a millionaire sport man. Yeah. So he picked up he, firsthand how they operated this whole financial system. See? So when the big depression hit, uh, he wrote a, pre, a treatise called Direct Credit Call what? Direct what for everybody? Oh. Direct credits for everybody. So he was also involved in basically economic things. Oh, yeah. That's what wiped his name out of existence. What do you mean? They don't care about aircraft. They don't care about losonomy. But this they're afraid of. Now, the little 60-some page book, I claim, is still the broadest education in the fewest words of any other book ever written. Because it doesn't deal just with money. And everybody could see that something was wrong in the Depression, but nobody understood why. And with just opening a book, there was the answer. I can remember 29, and my dad built his own home. He lost the home to the banks. Well, I was 13 when he got the direct credit book. We had a paper route and pulled into this farmer's yard and said, hey, hey, Here's something you ought to be interested in. It's a program that proposes justice for everybody that harms nobody. And if he had been a cat or a horse or something, his ears popped right up. His whole attitude changed. He says, well, that's interesting what you got. He started working in the organization right away. So by the time I was a senior, my dad took seven of us to Columbus, and that's where I first heard Lawson. has done many queer things heretofore, but none quite so stupid as chaining himself to this suicidal orgy of finance. I am ready and willing to show the people every trick the financiers and their touts practice on them. Join the Direct Credit Society and help stop the thief now before it's too late. That's what really locked me into Losonomy, because it was clear in my mind that if we didn't do something about it, we'd be a slave nation. As soon as I got out of school, I decided I'd take a little bike trip. Well, I made it from Toledo to Omaha in seven days, and just before I crossed the river, well, I ran across the Direct Credits Bureau out there, and the adjutant leader said, uh, that's a lot of biking, why don't you be at the Bureau for a while? And that was the start of my full-time life in Wasonomy. When he first went in, he just swallowed it all. 
I shouldn't say it that way, that sounds bad. He took it all in. I knew that he was gonna be leaving. My sister and I shared a bed and I was keeping her awake because I was upset and I was crying and my dad came, knocked on the door and he said, if you're gonna lay there and cry all night, you can go upstairs. And so I stayed by that window and when I saw the bike go by, I went back to, went back to bed and cried some more. I walked every day to get our mail to see if he wrote me a letter. And he never did. He never did. But I can't think about that, you know. That's been over 60 years ago. I, I just can't imagine that it's that long. She didn't know why he left even. She thought it was another girl, see? What else can you say? She really hurt. This business is sitting by a trailer all day, every day. It gets tiresome. When I was able to go over to the show and walk around, it was fun. It didn't seem like a job. I might not come back to another air show. And he don't like to hear that. And his life, he never had to really answer to anybody for where he was going or what he was doing. He used to just take off and go. Maybe he'll come without me or maybe I'll... I would miss him if he was up here for 10 days. 10 days seems like an awful long time to be apart when we have been apart for 62 years. <laughs> 10 days is too long anymore. We get enough support, I will be back. If I get my legs straightened out, she gets a bit feeling better. <laughs> time alone will tell. 31 years. That's almost as old as I am. <laughs> I think to be honest about the whole thing, when you're almost 90 years old, that's the time to, to throw in the sponge and enjoy something else. My family, they all say, why doesn't he stay? Well, I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't come here with if you weren't here. You wouldn't? No. <laughs> I, I made an agreement with him that I would stay there six months and he'd stay here six months. But I'm willing to do that, to be with him, because I think he was my first love. <laughs> 1935, we moved third house down from Betty. We sort of walked to the bus together. Sometimes he'd carry my books, but he never would carry them when the bus was in sight. That was quite a thing for somebody to carry your books. That was like an engagement. <laughs> I would try to help him with Latin, and it wasn't that wasn't my thing. Oh, he taught me how to say I love you. That was amote. Is that right? Pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> it was a one-sided love affair. I was in love. It <laughs> but every time he came around, I, I would try to get closer to him and closer. That was my job, to get closer. He said one day that he was going to ride his bike out through the West, and he got into the direct credits, uh, the activities organization there, and there never yeah. saw you after that. Is that showing the camera? Yeah. <laughs> but I got another boyfriend. Why should I sit around and wait for him? What about the picture on your school book? Is your yearbook down here? Oh, golly. I don't see where I cut it out. 
I carried his picture in my in my wall. Cut a little out of the high school album. I can't understand why you can't find the word. There's a hole in the book. Here, here we are. 1937, sophomore. Well, that's where you got I carried it. this picture for years. <laughs> I carried it in my wallet even after I was married, which was probably the wrong thing to do, but I did it. My first marriage, he was a good guy, but he drank. And all alcoholics are good guys, but they drink. He found it. And he said, why are you still carrying this guy's picture around? So I hid it underneath my underwear in my drawer. Uh, from that time, uh, the picture was here and there, and I didn't know where it was. See, you stick my finger through it. I, I should be on this page someplace. I thought you were on the same page. Nope. This is the one from our graduation. She's killing me. She's killing me. <laughs> oh, God. I was killing you all right. There were many times when I could have killed you. <laughs> but I guess there was still a spark there. When I heard his voice on the telephone, it was like uh, it's all starting over again. I was like a 60-year-old, and I was 80. I was glad to welcome him back. But I've, I, I've ruined a lot of it. I've been in and out of the hospital, and I don't know how good I would get along if he went up there and left me down here. You, would you get along all right if you went up there and I stayed down here? Well, I've got enough to do that I, I'd get along as far as that goes. You're the partial decision now. <laughs> I think we'll have nice weather all summer here. <laughs> I know, I told you, I'm down here for her, not the weather. Be here all summer. She's going to do some therapy for about a month. So, in the meantime, I'll do a lot as much organizing as I can. What's the word on Oshkosh? Not going to make it. You're not figuring on going to Oshkosh. Huh, that's the first I heard of this. I didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. oh. I think it's good. The last time we talked to you, he hadn't made up his mind. Sounds like he's made up his mind this time, that he's not going. And, and it's all right with me. I think it'll affect him that he's not going. When it comes May, June, or July, he'll probably want to go to the air show. But I think uh, my health is not as good as he thinks it is. <laughs> I moved out to the farm in November of uh, 57 and uh, spent the rest of our life out here. I cramped in here a hundred years of records and <laughs> trying to sort them. They're not really organized. I just kept piling and trying to get them into a collection.
that's a collection of reports that have been made to the FBI about the New York Credit Society. A sheriff from Port Huron, Michigan, uh, would also like to ask for information whether or not your department has ever heard or contact with a direct credit society. No one else seems to know anything about the society. We had opposition, that's for sure. <laughs> We've been called everything under the sun, communists, socialists, uh, radicals, anything anybody could uh, concoct in their mind to call us because they didn't know anything about it. The Direct Credit Society stands to abolish interest and eliminate taxes. The government will issue new money and loan it to the people without interest. If interest is not abolished soon, there will not be a manufacturer in America who will own his own factory, a farmer who will own his own farm. There is but one loophole of escape, direct credit for everybody. Well, direct credit, one of its main points is to abolish interest on the use of money. The other problem is to replace the private control of money and put it into the hands of the government according to the Constitution. But it's the selfishness of the people, actually, that they uphold this system because they think they can get something out of it, whereas they lose everything instead of gaining. Interest is fundamentally wrong, Lawson claimed. And that was proved in the Great Depression. It was caused by financiers. Lawson identified them as the target, and he soon had many members. You can imagine that any sort of economic panacea in the Depression is likely to get some attention. People flocked to Lawson, and he started his benefactor paper in Detroit. And he built that to the largest circulation in the world in less than seven years. I personally put out over 350,000 of them uh, door to door. I used to dread going up to a door for fear somebody would come out and holler at me and get that out of here. <laughs> One of his rules was we don't argue with anybody. We were study it and learn what we could learn, and once we understood it, then we offer it to other people. If they do not accept it, that's their loss. I started collecting these many, many years ago. Good Lord. <laughs> I didn't realize I had that many of them. Unless you know these things, you're not educated. Many of his ideas were very similar to those of Father Coughlin, who was also in Detroit at that very same time. So they were beating the bushes, looking for the same customers locally. Of course, Coughlin had the advantage because he was using the radio to get his message out. Lawson refused to use the radio because it was controlled by the financiers. Father Charles Edward Coughlin today is far more than just a valuable voice on the radio. I dared you and challenged you to organize so that the people, if not the president, would drive the money changers from the temple, and you did it! The direct credits advocate, if they wish, could make a strong case that uh, Coughlin swiped ideas from Lawson. But uh, too often, Coughlin let it be thought that, you see, the financiers were Jewish. I've searched Lawson's writings and his speeches with that very question in mind. It may be some of his followers were translating in their own minds, Jewish. But if they were, they had, they had Coughlin right on the scene. They could have followed him instead of Lawson. He had no complaint against people. It was the whole system. Fact is, a guy started talking against the Jews. And, and Lawson stopped him. He said, wait a minute, he says, now, this organization for the citizens of the United States for the people. It's for everybody. I went to one meeting. My dad and mother allowed me to go to one meeting. 
and I couldn't tell you now what they talked about. One night, after Merle and I had been sitting on the front porch for two hours, my dad said, you know, you better quit hanging around with him because he's nothing but trouble. Well, see, my dad was seeing the political end of it. But Merle was a prince to me. You know, I, I didn't care what he did. Be tight like that. <laughs> What's going to happen to all this stuff, bro? That's what I want to know. <laughs> the financiers have done everything to submerge Lawson or anything in connection with it. The only place it appears now is in connection with aircraft, not with economics or direct credits or anything else. If you mention Lawson to me today and they look at you weird, Who, what's that? The problem with this whole financial system is that the museums can, can sell something. They have to use the money, but they don't have to keep it. So. That's the problem. How do you know it's going to be safe? <laughs> this is a, a record of an era that there'd been none like it in history. I'm trying to preserve it for future generations if the human race don't blow the earth up beforehand. That's enough. <laughs> what was that one called? The Exercise March. <clears throat> do you have this? Yes, I do. Well, this is all songs that were written by members of our organization. <laughs> Stuff is what I call it. Stuff. The things that he cherishes the most, I think, are in Racine. He wants to get rid of all that stuff, but he doesn't really. Well, I want to preserve it. I don't want to get rid of it. <laughs> a lot of it is just junk, but there's interesting history there that uh, could very easily be lost. The real holy grail would be the audio recordings that Lawson made in 1931 or 32. But Merle says he doesn't have it, and I tend to believe him. He also didn't realize he had direct credits for everybody in Braille and it's in two huge volumes, and he didn't know he had it. So I hope that it ends up with someone who knows what it is. I, just, I hope that it just doesn't get bulldozed into a landfill, but it will be a huge research project to try and reassemble it. I'm working on, ah, I didn't want to do that. When I'm writing these letters, uh, I'm trying to spark everybody I can with the opportunity that Losonomy gives them to better the human race. They're all new people that I've met up at Oshkosh. <clears throat> it's just a matter of time and composition, that's all. Of course, I went into debt to do it. <laughs> How much money a month do you spend on mailing? I never calculated it. I just do it. <laughs> but I'm a little bit like Lawson. Money is not the purpose of my efforts. We fold them up, stick them in the envelopes. <laughs> Betty seals them, puts the stamps on them. Uh, it's a combination. We, we oh. do it together. Did you get mine? Yeah, it's <laughs> in She's actually afraid of me alone. And then when I left in 39, well, that stayed with her all her life, see? And now she's afraid that I'll come back. <laughs> so that's one we have to work out. <clears throat>
With me, it's like being on a racetrack. You don't win the race until you cross the finish line. So I hope to cross the finish line running. <laughs> Our speaker tonight is Merle Hayden, the new Alfred Lawson. Uh, he's also been connected with the University of Lausanne. I really found out in preparing for this particular meeting what a fascinating guy Merle is. Uh, I guarantee just one thing that's going to be different. <laughs> this was our first base at uh, Port Moresby in New Guinea. That's the P-51 fighter plane, worked in armament. When I went in service, I, I decided that I'd go and do what I had to do, but they could have the rest of it. It isn't that you like war, you want to fight or anything, you have to. <laughs> when I was overseas, I was writing to I think 40 some people in the organization trying to inspire them to keep up the organization work when it should have been the other way around. <laughs> Lawson was convinced that uh, America ought to be in that war, but it was at odds with his own view of, of war and whether the financiers caused war. The members, in my observation, are highly patriotic. And yet, from their own doctrine, it follows that they were bamboozled into this by the financiers. The financiers, you see, had created those wars. I don't think it really mattered to Lawson, though, because I believe he was getting to change his focus away from economics. With the event of the war, the direct credits lost its momentum. Uh, the numbers had dropped. People got money, got jobs, went back to their routine living, forgot about freedom and all of that. That was the loss of the big following. The people that stayed were the ones that were Lasonomy students. And that was a small part of the 12, 15 million followers that he had in the 30s. Here he was in the late 30s. He had a large following of people who were really committed to direct credits doctrine. And he was leading them in new directions. He was developing his philosophy into a coordinated, coherent whole that he called Lasonomy. He was going to have all his scientific, philosophical, economic views. Everything was in there. Actually, what Lawson did was to bring his doctrine of Lasonomy back to where it was in his original book, the novel Born Again from 1904. It's a terrible book full of improbable things. He put his thinking of Lasonomy into the story, but he introduced controlling the earth by sun power, controlling the electrical field of the earth, natural law, mental telepathy, health, many things like that. He introduced such uh, outlandish things as if he had put them out as facts, people wouldn't be interested in. All the things that he had enunciated in Born Again about the next wave of humanity, the improvement of the human species, would come true by virtue of aviation. Lawson thought if there would be people living in the air, they wouldn't come down to Earth. So we'd, in a sense, have a new superior race of humans living in the sky. Man must now prepare for another step forward in his continuous march towards a higher state of intelligence. Man's growth begins with exercise, builds up with nourishment, and recuperates with rest. The men and women of the future who study and practice pure Lawsonomy principles will evolve into giants, physically, mentally, and morally. Lawson was always concerned about his health. And so he reconceptualized all of physical activity in terms of suction and pressure. And he developed lots of rules for daily living, rules about how one should sleep in the nude, change the bed sheets every day, two cold baths every day, the emphasis on vegetarianism, on living a clean life, bringing about a, a, a dramatic change in the human condition. 
to think about this. Lawson had different philosophies. Nutrition was one when we first got back together. I knew that he didn't, that he never ate much cooked food. And to this day, he likes raw food. Probably wouldn't hurt me to do that. I probably would lose a little weight if I'd stick to raw foods. The more natural food you put into your body, the better the mental organisms and minorities can build a better formation. The thinking creatures within man, he called them mental organisms. These thinking creatures within us are actually living as much as we are in the greater sphere. The mental organisms, called the minorgs, are matched by the disorgs, the disorganizers. They're also submicroscopic. You can find uh, also in current doctrines this notion of little entities that can cause trouble. Uh, Scientology, for instance, has the, the concept of the theta beings. And they're just like the disorgs. They, do, they cause all kinds of problems. And uh, the way to deal with them, of course, is through Dianetics or Scientology. Sounds rather Lawsonian to me, in a way. <laughs> they will talk about maneuverability, which is essentially karma. And, and he believes it's possible to convey thoughts from one person to another without speaking. They will call that telementi, but I, I don't recall anyone claiming to be able to convey a specific message to someone else. It may have happened. Uh, all of this um, maneuverability and penetra penetrability and all those terms that he talks about, they're way out as far as I'm concerned. I, I, don't, I don't really understand it all. I don't have the same mentality that he does. get some quick definitions of Lawsonian words and phrases like zigzag and swirl. If well, you can put that on. I can. I can <clears throat> I can have just a narrator read it. Yeah. <clears throat> it would be more entertaining and, and more interesting to hear someone who really knows. <laughs> Boy, I haven't given that definition for a couple hours. Zigzag and swirl, the method of movement throughout space. All matter moves in a multiple direction simultaneously. Pulled and pushed by succotion and pressure in currents of differing density. That's all I can remember of it. Eternally. <laughs> when talking about any of Lawson's teachings, he would prefer to just recite. Because then he can't get it wrong. And he doesn't embellish. And he's just giving you what Lawson said, which is what Lawson wanted. The goal was to memorize those books. If you memorized and recited over and over and over again for 30 years, uh, you would become a new person, a member of the new species. Well, it was all home study, and, and finally he established the title of Knowledgeion, which was a 30-year course or a teacher of Lausanne. And I don't remember how many degrees were issued. Uh, I lost track of that. In 1943, the organization bought a defunct Baptist university in Des Moines, Iowa. So that began the University of Lausanne. At first, the people of Des Moines were very happy that someone was coming in and taking over this derelict property. But they had grown so accustomed to nothing being there that they used it as a shortcut across town or a lover's lane. And so people moving in and actually fencing it off got a lot of people very upset. 
The fence was a big deal. It looked like it was a metal fence, but it was just wooden. The papers always referred to it as a, an iron fence. And that probably didn't help either. And so the story started going around how people were in there and they were inmates, unable to get out. And there were a number of sensational episodes involving children who were there. A student at, at the University of Lasanami could be of any age. And some of those kids were there with their parents and some of the kids were sent there by their parents. And it looked like in some cases they were being banished there. They would get rid of troublesome kids, send them off to the University of Lasanami. And the kids, of course, were expected to do all the work that everyone had to do there. So it looked like they were violating the child labor laws. The university became a target. And I think it had to do with the inability of the outsiders to understand what was going on there. I think they were probably sitting in there just utterly perplexed why the outer world was hating them so much. They, they, they professed love concern for the outer world. All they wanted to do was be left alone and do their thing. And someday the world would benefit by virtue of their activities. person reacts to what they read in the newspapers. Uh, the common person today is not a thinking machine. They'd brand you right away. Des Moines was always looking for reasons to not like the University of Lasonomy. Lawson, without trying to do so, was giving them ammunition for that. And Lawson one day announced that he had been married for about a year and had a child. Lawson had always uh, written denunciations of marriage, and especially as it applied to him. There was big hullabaloo because I think many of his followers thought, well, he's the leader of this organization. He's married to the organization. I think Lawson was thinking in terms of, uh, as he said, posterity, letting his genes pass on. His good character, all his fine features that he had acquired in his lifetime would be passed on genetically. He had, I don't know, 20 girls working there in the office, but apparently he had watched Eleanor for a long time. And um, putting some of this together afterwards, but there was a, a lot of them were jilted over the deal. They, they didn't get him and so forth, you know. And the whole thing just apparently exploded. It, it was uh, an interaction of many forces that broke the thing up. Probably the last break was when he formally announced Lawsonian religion. There was nothing basically changed in his principles at all. He merely adapted the principles into a religion. The only change was formalizing it and calling it such. worshiper, no doubt about it. There were people that worshiped Lawson. I never looked up to him as God. Then the thought never entered my head. I knew he was the leader. I knew he was an advanced thinker, so I never argued with him. I <laughs> didn't know enough to argue with him. <laughs> but those who had any ax to grind, why, they decided that was the end. If Lawson had stuck to economics, he'd have been all right. But when he stepped into into spirituality, I, he was outstepping his bounds. 
it seems to me that by the time they, they were in Des Moines, all the independent people had either left or he threw them out. So he was left with uh, people who slavishly were loyal to him. Did they separate themselves from society? They did. Did they have some unorthodox beliefs? Yes. There are instances where Lawson would send the father of a family to a bureau in one state and the mother to a bureau in another state, and the kids would live with their grandparents. He had members of the organization change their names, and those are things, you know, it's if you are changing your identity, what you are called because someone asks you to, that that's another aspect of, of a charismatic leader of a religion. So I think most people who analyze and study cults would refer to it as a cult. But, you know, every religion that gets started starts as a smaller group and eventually grows. This one so far has not. But there's more to it than just a religion. He may have been looking for a tax break. The university, when it started, received a tax-exempt status as a university, which they were. Some point after the Second World War, the University of Lausanne bought a bunch of machine tools as war surplus at a big discount. Everything was fine for a while, but and the government decided they didn't like how that machine tool business happened, so they came in and they revoked their status as a university, which took away their tax-exempt status. And they didn't just revoke it, but they revoked it retroactive to 1943, so that's a decade of back taxes that they suddenly owed. When the government was bringing those cases against the university out there in Des Moines, brought this $360,000 lawsuit against us for back taxes when we were tax exempt. Lawson made me assistant secretary for the university. It took me over a year just to get down so I could understand the tax return. Picking up scraps of paper and cash receipts, trying to set up a bookkeeping system. That was the hectic period of my life because I got stuck with the whole job there for a while. I was even doing cooking. <laughs> he used to come out downstairs in the kitchen and eat with the rest of us. Apparently, the publicity on the court case had picked up momentum. He said, well, they can take everything we've got, but if we still have our principles, we're still ahead of the game. He was trying to build us up for whatever was to come. In 1954, uh, Lawson finally threw in the towel and sold the university, and most of the profit that he got uh, had to be used to settle the tax claims. So the whole program came crashing down. I had to grin and bear it and keep going. That's all of us to it. Well, he says, my work's done. He says, uh, I'm just living for my officers now. So he knew that he wasn't here for much longer. This first part was filmed on November 5th, 1954, just three weeks before Alfred Lawson's passing. How thankful we are to be privileged to have this short film preserved for posterity. There was a closeness of spirit, a sense of union. He would start a colony where his beloved followers could live together harmoniously. Even though we could not converse with him on his high level, still we felt that the flood of lovability we poured out to him made up in a small way for our lack of advancement. When the last call came from our beloved commander, his last words had been, Now I can go to sleep as if all his cares had been forgotten. On November 29th, 1954, 
five men, Edwin Knudsen, William Bertrand, E.L. Bates, Edgerton Bolton, and Merle Hayden met on this sad mission in San Antonio, Texas. I'm finding out that I'd seen him two days before and now he was gone. It just felt like the bottom dropped. That's right after the fire was started. Okay. Yeah. So did you feel like you missed out on a lot of this, Betty? I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know if I would have. She'd have been with us if she'd have gotten in early. Yeah, but I didn't get into it. My dad wouldn't let me. This was Margie before we were married. In fact, 10 years before. <laughs> she came in in 32, one of the very earliest members. The first children's classes that Lawson had was held in her parents' home. So she grew up with Lawson right from the beginning. I met her in 49. Uh, after the, one of the meetings, people were leaving, and, and I can still remember her mother talking to me, saying that Margie had just come through a terrible divorce. And uh, I think the comment I made, oh, you poor girl, <laughs> something like that. But that was my introduction to her. I'd take the young people out to park, and we'd would study in Lawson's books. And uh, she became a part of the group, got involved in everything. When I was a young girl, I wanted to be a doctor. I was always telling people what to do to help them, you know. Of course, when the Depression came, my dad said to me, uh, you're going to have to change your course. I won't be able to put you through college. And Well, I didn't think about working and putting myself through. So that's when I switched over to the secretarial work, and I became a secretary. But I never got over wanting to help people and telling them what to do to help themselves, and I'm still trying to help people. <laughs> but I always thank my spiritual advisor for everything. And Lawson didn't want us to worship him. He wanted our love and respect. And that's what we gave him. Now, I know that Lawson gave you some mixed signals about whether he wanted you to get married or not. Oh, yes. Now, this one time, and he says to me, don't take my good man away from me. Went, oh, no. And I was just about ready, you know, to give up everything and marry Merle. Two months later, it might have been a month later, and we were uh, throwing the ball. He says, you know, if you want that man, <laughs> I thought, why? If I want him, <laughs> I sure do. Don't wear those pants like the women wear in the, the war factories. He wanted me to dress like a woman. So I thanked him. <laughs> so he did sanction that I could marry Merle. To think first he told me not to and then, then told me I couldn't. <laughs> but it was good because it gave me, you know, made me think serious. If had lost and lived, I probably wouldn't have gotten married because I'd been too totally involved in the movement. Margie and I just sort of molded together, I guess you could say it. We got married in April of 61, and it was a team effort from then on. I saw Merle needed help, you know, because Merle didn't have any money. Well, I quit my job. I would have had a wonderful pension if I'd have stuck with it. I got a quite a bit of money. So I said to Merle, well, let's, let's do something with that money, put it in the bank and it's gone. So we bought the organ, and we bought a car, a trailer, so that, that way the money wasn't just thrown, thrown away. I've never regretted it. I never regret giving up my job. I was always trying to do something for the organization. You know, when you're working for somebody else, they tell you what to do. Here, people come to us.
Lawson, he was gone. And they had lost the university, and the money they got from it was pretty well eaten up in back taxes. Uh, so what did they do next? The Lawsonomists owned a farm in Sturdivant, Wisconsin. And that's where they ended up and continued to do pretty much what they had done at the uh, Des Moines University. We had a few people living there, and they were going through the motions of learning lasonomy, and they would have big get-togethers. successful movements, they must have a, a leader. It isn't just ideas that hold people together, it's often a charismatic type of leader. Lawson was that, and he could get his followers to do anything. But when he's gone, there was no provision for any succession. There was some provision you know, a board would take over, but a, a board of people who lacked any sense of independent authority, any leadership skills. They were uh, incapable of acting alone. They needed someone like Lawson there to, to guide them. Merle started taking the reins after Lawson died because Merle was living on the property and everyone else would just show up once a month. It was Merle and Margie that became the voice and, and face of the organization for all intents and purposes. Finally, at some point, the board said, you're not in charge. It's supposed to be run by the board and not by Merle alone. And so when they finally decided to assert their control, it led to a lot of bad blood. They voted me out in 97 and Margie out in 98. There was no discussion, no one charges, nothing about it. They conspired against me and they just did it. <laughs> Coup d'etat, they call it. <laughs> it was all a matter of the money deal. It was 300 and some thousand that they sold for just 20 acres here. The only comment she ever made about the group took over the university was that she never wanted to see any of them again. So that left Margie and I more or less on our own. So we just moved into Racine and went on our own and kept going up to Oshkosh and that's what really carried it. They wanted me to turn over the Oshkosh a booth to him. Well, I wouldn't do it. I kept it. And up at Oshkosh, my Margie was huh, my helpmate. <laughs> and after people would come to our booth, as they would start to leave, she'd stop them and she'd say to them, Alfred Lawson says, for every act, there's a react. Good acts bring good reactions. Bad acts bring bad reactions. So instead of saying goodbye, we say, good reaction. But you have to have the back of your hand in front of your face. Good reaction. So I've been doing that now. This will be my third year. And I like that. Good reactions. Bring good acts. It was just like that. She just collapsed sometime in late morning. And we took him to the hospital. 
We stayed there a while. She'd had a blood clot in her brain. It was bad enough that it, they could never bring her back to normal. So the decision was to leave it. And that's when she died. She wasn't just a partner. She was a crusader, like me. I thought after Margie was gone that Merle was done. And a year or so later, Merle asked if I'd ever heard of a website called classmates.com. And I had heard of it. But he said he was on there and he met an old friend of his. I had no idea who he was talking about or, or what, and it turned out it was Betty. He and Betty at age 82 met once again online. When I first got the letter from classmates, I thought, after all this time, that can't be the same Merle Hayden. But who would have a name like that? <laughs> Merle. <laughs> How many people do you know that have the name Merle? <laughs> and for us to get back together after 62 years, never seeing or hearing anything from each other was wonderful. Things just worked around to a point where we got back together. What causes things like that? Why do you do that? See, Lawson has an answer. It's maneuverability, but there's a uh, what do you call it, a physical uh, something that happens that causes that, I don't know. But Merle will answer that for you if you got a day or so to listen. <laughs> In the last 10 years, having a partner, Betty took up a lot of time that I should have been doing on this horse thing. <laughs> As far as having the partner, that wasn't uh, part of my functioning in life. I've got too much to do. I accept his personality. I guess I learned when I was 18, he was going to do what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. I don't think right at this point that I'm coming back up here next year. But I don't know, I might change my mind. Right now I'm not able to get down the steps here if I had to. They'd have to come up and take me out. Dear Merle, I emailed the EAA band director, Elton Isley, a few weeks ago that I had a copy of the Airline March and wanted to play it at this year's air show. If you are able to attend, we should have you say a few words about the first airliner before we play the song, Lori Douglas. Whether I get to Oshkosh is gonna be a question this time. Up until this year, though, it wasn't. So I don't know whether I uh, give up or not. I don't know when or if Lawsonomy will end, but when Merle goes, it'll be a big blow to the organization. He seems to be alone tilting at windmills. Hey. Hey, let a smile be your umbrella on a rainy, rainy day. Merle believes that I am a Lawsonomy student. And depending on how you define that, I certainly am a Lawsonomy student. This was supposed to be a recitation. We'll see if I make it through all the way without cheating.
The human race must learn to act together as one body, just as the menorgs within man act together as one body. The most important thing man can do right now is to take an internal bath and clean out all of the piggish disorders that infect his mental system and degrade him. That is something worth thinking about and working for. Alfred Lawson. <laughs>my documentary is uh, far from finished because anyone who does not present simply a cheerleading piece for the organization, Merle will not be happy. And I don't know if he would uh, communicate with me anymore. That's the thing that worries me most. I, you know, it's, I just, I made this promise to myself about a dozen years ago that I would keep helping Merle and set up the booth and keep running the booth because otherwise it would just be Merle. That terrifies me, and I know that Thank you. he will go for as long as he can go, and if something stops him from going, it, that same thing will probably stop him permanently. Oh, oh, Merle. What was that? My it's guitar. <laughs> Everybody's been very nice and very, very helpful. And mm -hmm. I had a slight stroke on the right leg. Slight, I had a slight stroke, and I was so befuddled, I didn't know what I was doing. So that's how I noticed that something was wrong. And, oh, that's a job. Yeah. yeah, that's my suitcase to go to Naples with. <laughs> So tomorrow she'll be in Toledo, and the next night she'll be in Naples. I'll be home. And that plan has all been worked out between Merle and his thing that he has to do at the air show. I, I, I don't like him not to be with me because I, I, I feel like I'm walking on one leg without him. But he has to go to the air show. There's almost nobody left that has any idea of what I'm involved in. My whole life has been to make a better world for the children of the future. And I haven't changed my mind since I was 18 years old. <laughs> it's going to make a better world for the children. That's right. <laughs> I'm a children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he laughs about it, but you know, it wasn't hard for him to say goodbye to me when we were 18. And I asked him, how long are you gonna be gone? He don't know. So I feel like, uh-oh, he's gone. <laughs> and he might not come back. <laughs> See, he's got different kind of feelings than we do. He doesn't express his feelings very well. And I, I think, I should express them for him if he doesn't. <laughs> and I would like to be able to help him. I don't know if I could. I couldn't right now, but I could later, maybe. So, but he makes the decisions for himself, and, and that's what I guess I have to go by. <laughs> In the daily paper here, it reads, the EAA concert band will be performing an arrangement of the airline march by Edgar W. Croft at the Theater of the Woods. 
The inspiration for the performance of this piece is Merle J. Hayden, EAA member and historian of the Lawson Airliner and friend of its inventor, Alfred W. Lawson. Hayden will be turning 90 years old in September this year. 32 years to get our name in there. And Jim's responsible. Sorry, I don't care anymore. I just sold the piece of music. Wednesday night, Theater in the Woods, the band is going to play this. Hmm. The band is going to play this. No. Oh, uh huh. Where is that? The Theater okay. in the Woods. That's terrific. I get to introduce it. Oh, do you really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't say, well, this is your year then. <laughs> this is your year. <laughs> Is Elton here yet? Who? Director? Uh, yes. Uh, he's... Way back? Yeah, way back. Blue shirt. Uh, Elton Isley. Right, Earl Hayden. Nice <laughs> to meet you, sir. Mutual. Yeah. What I would like to do is try to get this published for oh, fans. Boy. I think, I, I think wow. we could do that. So for... I've been here 32 years. Yeah. This is the first break we've had. Hi, huh? <laughs> honey. Oh, I am. We're over, we're over in the woods, and I talked to the director, and he is, he is really th thrilled about it, and he wants to publish it. How about that? <laughs> you talk about a break. You talk about a big break. Boy, this was it. Do your stand-up exercises today. You sit down and stand up five times. Oh yeah, we'll see you later. Bye now. You talked to Betty today? Mm hmm twice. Did you call her or did she call you? Both. Okay. That's okay. We can't have it be a one-way relationship. <laughs> Betty's kept him going these past few years, and he's kept her going, I think, so. So if you move to Florida. I'm not moving to Florida. You're not? Mm-mm. I really hate to leave Wisconsin because so much is involved in right in that area there. That if I hadn't stuck with this place, they'd all been gone long before this. This is what kept going for years. Yeah. This last year, Lori Douglas, one of our players in the group, picked up a, um, a piece of music in, in the fly mark and arranged it for the group. And we have Mr. Um, Mr. Hayden over here that's going to come out and tell you some of the history of this, of this piece, Mr. Hayden. Yeah, the airline march was written by a man, a Chicago newspaper reporter, uh, Edgar Croft, who was a passenger on the first airline in 1919. It shows the ship that made Milwaukee famous. <laughs> we have a big book called The Aircraft Industry Builder. It's my privilege to present it to our director tonight. He's my president. <laughs>
Thank you very much. It was great. It worked out fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, honey. Well, the climax is over. They got the, yep, it went, it was terrific. It was great, I tell you. Everybody was saying it's too bad that he wasn't there. <laughs> They've got pictures of the whole work. Yeah, just a matter of time, you may be able to see it all. Yeah, it's too bad you couldn't have been here. It was really something. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the way it had to turn out. We couldn't control it, so. I know, I know. Yeah, okay. You can have a good night's sleep tonight. Okay. Night, honey. Night, honey. Night. Night. Mo sent out letters to a lot of different historical agencies around the country, trying to interest them in material about, about Lawson and his career. And we were one of the places that he responded. And, uh, this is where all the, the real work is done. <laughs> we basically put everything we've gotten from you out on this table here. Do you recognize this, right? The Lawson aircraft. Oh, I'm glad I this stuff. I suppose you ask the average person on the street who Alfred Lawson is, and, you know, they're probably not going to know who he is. But if the research material is available, he can be rediscovered. And who knows? Though There could be a renaissance of Alfred Lawson. You never know. That's what we look forward to. <laughs> but that there is, is the direct credits book in Braille. There's only one like it. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm glad we yes. caught it. Got a review of all the stuff they've got that they're pretty serious about preservation of the material. I begin to realize why my apartment is a little bit bigger now, though. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, always a pleasure. Whole, a whole day next time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I, I don't I don't want to wear you out. You know. Well, you don't worry, won't worry me out. <laughs> by myself <laughs> in my thinking. Memories are, are forever. When Marty died, I was only 80. That's a good one, ever. At the end of my life, I, I hadn't given any thought to it. I just had to carry on the work, with or without her. But after Betty died, I was 90. That's when it really hit me, coming back up here, and realizing that my years on Earth were strictly limited now. That began to uh, make quite an impression on me. It's a heavy burden I had work to perform. And that's, uh, that, that's uh, the whole part of, of my life is, is doing this big job. <laughs> no longer see objects about me, when my ears no longer record sound messages, 
When my nostrils do not attract odors, nor my taste distinguish flavors, when external pressure can no longer affect my mentality, nor internal pressure register the appeal of my voice, when the power of suction has deserted me, and my body is dissolved, and the substances of which it is composed have returned to the great ocean of density from whence they came, my words must still talk and urge you forward in a search of unlimited knowledge to be found in the unexplored regions of penetrability.